Welcome to the Seed Creative Podcast, the podcast where we discuss both video production and just life in general. The goal of this podcast is the same as the goal of our business, to make a difference in people's lives. Hello, this is George Edmondson. Welcome to the Seed Creative Podcast. Today's guest, uh, first of the new year, 2022, we finally got him, Jared Land from Red. It took 47 emails plus some text messages because Jared Land is such a busy guy. Yeah, he's so busy. But yeah. he responded to all oh, of yeah, them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've been great. <laughs> they were all responsive. But without further ado, here he is, Jared Land, Woo! finally president of Red. Jared Land, Jared Land, does whatever Jared can. We can see him, kind of. Oh, hello, hello. All right, we can see some text. There, oh, there he is. Uh, all right. How's it going, dudes? What's up, man? How are you? Howdy. Oh, look at you, you all professional over there with your... We're trying. No, we tried. Here's the thing. <laughs> What's sad is what you see looks absolutely terrible, but what they all see looks wonderful. So, But that's, you know how that goes. Of course. It's movie man back there. Yeah, dude. Yeah. So, how, so look, uh, you know, you know who I am, of course. This is George Edmondson talking to Mr. Jared Land, but this is Nick Golden, and Nick is gonna nice fanboy out yeah, of here for a, a minute. I'm, I'm a big Red fanboy. I'm, I'm 22 years old, and I've known of Red since I was 12. So, I'm a, I'm a nerd as it, as it were. Wow, word. that makes me feel old, but that's awesome. I was, yeah, I was worried <laughs> you were gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. So, Jared, we appreciate you taking the time to come on the Seed Creative Podcast. Um, a lot of people have, if they follow our podcast, they kind of already know a little bit about you and about our relationship with Red. But uh, there's a lot of people that also might not know. So we wanted to just kick things off, man, really quickly. Uh, tell us what Red is and who you are and, and what you do there. Well, Red is the camera company. Um, and we also, where I am is we own a studio in Hollywood as well, Red Studios. Uh, and we kind of, I guess who I am, I am the president of Red and co-owner of Red, both the studio and the camera company. And I mean, there's an origin story that's kind of long, but, uh, yeah, it's basically Jim and I, uh, kind of Jim's retired now but he's still obviously I lean on him a lot for inspiration he came from Oakley started Oakley mm -hmm. uh many moons ago and we both were shooters he was shooting all the Oakley commercials and um you know just a camera nut you know and it's obviously they had a lot of commercials and they had a lot of uh filming to do and not just action sports but um just everything that oakley touched and so he really got into before he sold the company he really got into the digital kind of revolution he was shooting stuff on 35 millimeter film um and then the panasonic camera came out which is kind of where I entered this whole uh, arena was I was at, living in Vancouver, Canada, and I was a I started a bike messenger company because when I was a kid or when I was, you know, four, 14 to probably 18 or 19, I was racing mountain bikes up in in Canada and I moved to Vancouver and being a bike messenger just seemed like a natural progression of, you know, <laughs> doing what I love to do and getting paid for it. So it was pretty gnarly. I mean, I rode a hundred kilometers a day, every single day. Wow. Oh, and yeah, it's, it's insane <laughs> through traffic. And, you know, Vancouver is a lot like San Francisco where lots of Hills. Uh -huh. um, and one of my clients uh, was a law firm and in a big high rise 
And it was the weirdest thing. This I became friends with the receptionist because that's who I'd mostly interact with to pick up packages and, and documents. And she would get dropped off in a, like a Lamborghini or a Rolls Royce. And she'd wear a big fur, crazy coat every day. And she'd always have the, you know, Chicago Bulls, I think at that year, but the championship ring. And I'm like, who's this receptionist? Like, you know, this baller receptionist. Um, so as I got to know her, I kind of asked and, and kind of peered into who she was. And she turned out to be the Shaw, married to one of the Shaw family brothers. And the Shaw family, uh, from China, they did all the Bruce Lee movies, yeah. Shaw Studios. Uh, so, and they did, they were still making movies. Um, you know, I think uh, I know what you did last summer was happening right then. But anyways, th they were obviously a very wealthy family that ended up owning. Sorry, let me just mute this, hopefully. I'm sure you um, get like 50,000 texts today. So we yeah, understand. It's, ins <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> uh, so anyways, the uh, she was obviously new into filmmaking and films and producing and they were uh obviously very connected and she asked me she's like why don't you sh do a documentary on bike messengers because it's such a cool kind of like inside yeah. kind of world that with its own culture that nobody really knows about and i thought wow hey that's a great idea but i was you know it was my own company and i was working a bazillion hours a day i didn't have time to go to film school so i kind of researched cameras this was right when the dvx 100 was just being announced which was one of the first 24p cameras um that was released and it was david mullen who's a uh, still a working dp he did this little kind of shootout between a Sony PD-150, I think, and the DVX, and he chose the DVX. So that's the one that I bought. And then I so I bought this crazy camera, and I didn't know how to use it. Like, had no idea how to use it. <laughs> I was just kind of like, oh, shit, I've got this awesome camera, and how am I going to do this? And I couldn't go, like I said, I couldn't go to film school. There really, this was before Facebook. There right, was no yeah. YouTube. This was, you know, there was no social media. Um, but there was this thing called bulletin boards that kind of were very vague and nonspecific. So I thought I've been a computer guy my whole life. I mean, when I was eight years old, um, I was writing code. So... I decided to build my own little kind of bulletin board forum. Now they're called forums um, purely so I could just ask people questions. So I thought I'll start this little thing centered around the DVX. It was called, I called it DVX user. Uh, and I made it. And for the first, you know, six months, there was nobody there. Really, there was just me and maybe three people that I knew. Right. And I could have just, you know, called them on the phone, but whatever. We just pretended to ask each other questions on the on this forum. What year was this? This was 2002, maybe yeah. 2003. What computer um, were you using? Do you remember? I had, so I built the server. I actually, so I was living in Vancouver in this little 600 foot square foot apartment. And I had this closet that I built the server in. And it was probably at that time, oh man, I can't remember the actual hardware I was using. Cause back then you couldn't just really sign up for a web host like you could yeah, now. Yeah. You have to actually, like I had to download Apache, which was a web server and learn how to configure Apache and then get a phone line for it. Um, and DSL, I think I finally landed on. And so that was in my closet and DVX user was literally being run from my closet. Wow. <laughs> and, yeah, it was great. It was insane. And it was like that until 
I mean, for many years. Um, but so I, I start about six months into it, all of a sudden it just exploded. And all of a sudden people started going to it and there was a bunch of members. And I met uh, one guy named Nick Bickenick, who I became friends with. And he happened, just happened to be in Vancouver as well. And he was a member and he was shooting a short film and he asked me to come and shoot with him. So I thought, oh, this is great. You know, some real world uh, actual shooting experience while I was still kind of writing this documentary. Um, and so I got so we shot this little short film. It was great. Had a lot of fun. Learned a lot. This uh, the main DP was um a guy named Todd who was just phenomenal, super talented. And uh, I think about three months after that, somebody that worked on that film was shooting a feature film on this little island in, in, in Canada. And they hired me to come along and be the B camera guy um, and second unit DP. And again, I had no idea what I was doing. And yeah. this was out in the middle of nowhere. It was, you know, on a little, little, on a little island in the middle of nowhere. And I couldn't, you know, I just had to kind of learn as I went. Another great uh, main DP that I learned, probably the most I've learned from, um, was shooting. And it was a low budget horror film uh, that Rob Schneider, Deuce Bigelow, actually was producing. And so I was out on this little island and DVX user was going crazy at that time and it crashed. The mm. whole server crashed and I was oh. stuck on this island. You couldn't, you know, I couldn't connect to it. So DVX user was down for like four weeks while I was uh. out uh, shooting on this little island. And then I was like, oh, shit. Um, you know, this is a problem. And you probably had no, uh, no way of even letting like the users know or anything. They were just like, no. what happened? Yeah. It just went dark. And I was like, shit. And you, you know, you can look at the kind of archive on, on DVX user. And there's this little window of a month that it's just <laughs> completely dead. Um, but, and I didn't really, you know, we obviously the internet was around back then. So it took me actually a couple of days to even know it was down because I kind of logged in after shooting one night and it was like, Oh shit, nothing's there. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, shot that movie, uh, then came back to Vancouver, man. I'm telling you the long version of this story. Oh, we want, We're enjoying man. it. Yeah. That's what we want. <laughs> Tell me to shut up if it's too long. That's what we want. Cause, Cause I'm going through it all. But so then I came back, uh, to Vancouver and, Rob Schneider, who was the producer of this low budget ho horde, told asked me to come down to LA um, and help him shoot this boxing documentary. And I was like, man, this is perfect because it's a documentary and this is what I want to do about the courier thing. And uh, so I thought, yeah, hell yeah. So I you know flew down to uh, LA to here and started shooting this documentary which was a ton of fun and a lot of met a lot of incredible people um well a lot of friends i still have to this day and i got this weird call from they were shooting this move spielberg's munich at that time and they had to do these pickup shots of the four foreign markets. So, you know, Munich, I don't know if you remember that movie or ever saw that movie. Um, there was some nudity in it and some, you know, bad stuff in it for, I think India was one of the markets. So we had to reshoot so, or they needed to reshoot some scenes. And I got this weird call, like, why don't you reshoot this, these scenes as the DP and as, you wow. know, as, as and I'm like, oh shit. Okay. Make it till and you it make was, it. That's quite the phone call. Know, dude, it fully was fake it till you make it. I love it. Hey, and, Spielberg needs you get out there. Like, yeah, <laughs> of course. You know, this is, I'm sure Spielberg didn't even know this was happening because it's <laughs> a random shitty little thing. Um, but it was at a, like a little studio in, in the Valley and I show up and I'm like, holy fuck, I'm in way over my head. Um, 
but you know, it was it. Oh, am I allowed to swear on here? It doesn't matter. We, yeah, we're good. We'll 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 cut it if we feel like we need to. <laughs> so did that and just kind of exploded. Just kept going from there. Um, and you know, I had this courier business, and I had a couple employees that were kind of running it. Um, damn, different messengers. Um, <laughs> It was, it was, uh, you know, it just kept going and the courier thing was kind of going along, but I never really went back. You know, I, I, of course I had to go back to move. Um, but it kind of just evolved. And I, with that first guy with Nick, who I did that first short with, he did a doc, he ended up doing a documentary, on mercenaries in Africa. And he said, Hey, come along, you know, I need somebody to shoot this. So, um, we went and flew to Sierra Leone and I saw some crazy stuff. That, that was the most craziest experience of my life. Uh, so we, you know, we shot that thing. And while I was in Africa, you know, this is obviously a couple of years forward and, I got a weird message from this Jim Gennard guy who was a member of DVX user because nice. he bought, oh, right. he just bought the Panasonic camera and he was a member of DVX user just on there like a normal dude asking everybody questions yeah. and kind of, you know, like we all were, we were all there to kind of learn and, and teach each other. Um, and he's like, Hey, come, come to Lake forest, which is in Irvine, uh, Southern California where Oakley was. And he just sold Oakley at that point. Uh, and he's like, Hey, I got this idea. I'm doing this thing. Come down and love to talk to you. And I had no idea who he was or what this was all about. And, and so I got back from Africa and thought, hell, you know, man as well go see what this is all about go to Oakley, which is an insane, at that time, it was just a, the most insane bunker of a, of a building, uh, and just instantly got along with him. And, you know, he won, he saw, he was shooting 35 millimeter and he really was disappointed, not really disappointed, but he knew that all these digital cameras that everybody that Sony and Panasonic and everybody were making weren't pushing far enough yeah. to kind of take over film like and this is when when still photographer and still cameras were starting to get that point where you could actually shoot digital yeah. on a still camera and be a proper replacement where you know the the video cameras were just kind of video cameras right. with either 720 or 1080p um so he's like you know if nobody's going to do this then why can't we do it? And so we kind of just got to work on it. And we, again, didn't know anything. I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. We really didn't. But man, did we put in the work. I mean, there was, we hired some people. Um, and, you know, Graham was there. We got Stuart English from Panasonic, who was kind of their product guy. Loved that guy. Uh, but picked a kind of a couple people that did know what they were doing and just started assembling these Frankenstein cameras. Yeah. And I had a little experience, um, another kind of side story along this, this whole path I met with, we were, me and Nick were, or Nick and I were playing around with these high speed cameras um, and from vision research, yep. they just mm -hmm. made this, this digital camera replacement for their film, um, right. high speed camera, but it had a good resolution. And of course this insane frame rate. Um, so we started playing around with this vision research. This was before, re before I met Jim, we started playing around with these things and we actually met the sons, the owner's son, um, in Whistler, BC, when we were on a snowboarding trip, uh, we met him and this guy's like, Hey, you, you can have North America distribution on the filmmakers market. And of course, Nick and I, we really weren't <laughs> in the industry at that point. We knew some people at that, at that time, but, um, 
we we're like, just, you know, give us a camera and let us, let us go out and shoot this thing. And the, I think the website still is around. It's called purpose, purposefilms.com. Uh, but we basically took that high speed camera and treated it more like a 24 P camera. Cause that was, you know, they didn't have any frame rate restrictions. They were like, you can shoot one frame rate, one frame per second. Here you go. Or 12 or 24 or 30 or 60 or a thousand, yeah. you know, just dial, it was more like a computer. Um, so anyways, I, I had a little bit experience tinkering with that camera. Of course, I had a great relationship with Panasonic because I, at that, you know, as DVX user grew, it became kind of their marketing vehicle. Yeah. Um, wow. And the, you know, fast forward to when we were, we were in the little, in one of Jim's warehouses in, in Irvine, just, we were literally turning knobs on circuit boards that a sensor had. And Jim would, you know, we'd shoot a Macbeth chart, which is a color chart. Um, I think it's X right now, kind of renamed it, but um, we would shoot a color chart and, you know, I would shoot it, turn the dial a little bit. Jim would go and he'd write the color. He was writing the color science. Again, we were just oblivious. We just knew what it should look like. Yeah. We didn't really know how to get there, but you turn the knob and it goes a little green and you turn the knob the other way, it goes a little red. And, you know, you do that for all these registers and then you add different voltages um, and it get it changes things. So we just kind of made this, this concoction of, wow, you know, this is actually turning into something at a proper resolution at 4k resolution that it's actually this might actually be viable so we you know all the way to the red one when we launched the red one i think we had six employees maybe Dude, that's um, we had a we had a bunch of of course we had a bunch of consultants and stuff that we were hiring and uh, some engineering firms that were were helping with you know board layouts and all that stuff but it was it got to the point where we stuff accessories started to come in matt tremblay was you know who's still um i work side by side with who is our our chief designer and um always was he he would make cool looking stuff and we sent it out to get manufactured and when we started with stuff started coming in like case truckloads of parts and we didn't even have a warehouse guy like we weren't that far we were so far ahead of the business right yeah. we start when we took red one um pre-orders we were using paypal and the paypal shut us off because they were a scam like we got banned from paypal because oh, they, they thought, thought you were, were a just, scam yeah. yeah, they thought we were scammers because there were so much, so many people giving us deposits. They're like, who are these guys that just showed up yesterday? And everything was on a spreadsheet. It was just so, I mean, it was gorilla, 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 they which I love. your expectations? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We had no idea. We got a little bit of sense because we, you know, on DVX user, of course, I created a little red section in there. Yep. Um, and there was a lot of interest, but we had no idea just how many people were ready for something better than was that than was out there. And a lot of people just didn't believe that we could ever do it. And, you know, it really shouldn't, we really shouldn't have been able to do it, but, you know, we were sleeping under desks, you know, right. we, we were, it was 18, 19, 20 hour days that, um, to actually make it all happen. And it really is a miracle that it happened. And then the team started growing and, you know, we got a proper building instead of just a little warehouse, um, and just started, you know, ship the first camera, the first 50 cameras, we had a little kind of pre-order thing and, we kind of did that because we knew they would all probably melt. <laughs> we thought uh, that they would all blow up and have to be replaced, you know, because it was our first thing. Un incredibly, it, th those things were pretty solid. Um, and, you know, then filmmakers, 
um, you know, Soderbergh came along and was like, hey, I'm shooting this Che movie in the jungle and, you know, give me uh, give me a couple cameras and I'll go out. And we're like, OK, but these are prototype prototype cameras. Mm -hmm. And um, so bring, you know, here we have a Sony, whatever it was, 900 at that time. And we had all the other cams we were like, we'll give you one of these cameras as well. You know, the Sony is a backup or the Panasonic Vericam is a backup. Let's just send. And he's like, no, I don't want to take this crap. We're in the jungle. Just, just, I just want a couple cameras and, you know, I'll make it work. And we're like, oh no, this is a disaster. <laughs> complete disaster because these things are going to melt down um but he was like no i'm not taking a backup like it just has to work so yeah, that wow. just forced us to push and move and go and um you know we had a we had so such so many weird experiences on that film we had um we just hired dean in at that time who was from dalsa and um so he was kind of like the technician that went out to, I think they were in Spain. I could, or um, at, at some of that leg, but he would literally have to take the cameras out in the after shooting in the middle of night and clean spider webs. Cause somehow the Holy spiders crap. got in there and started making webs and stuff in the camera. So he was the stuff that was insane. What that happened in that shoot was insane, but it pulled off and it was incredible and you know it was just uh, then peter jackson came and and then david fincher and all of these guys which you know really were really were ahead of their time um just m pushed us so hard so and so i've got a couple questions so first off and this doesn't have to be like super long answer or anything but do you or Jim have like any any engineering backgrounds, or were y'all just like we're just gonna figure not, it out? Not that, not at all. I I self taught, so yeah. I would computers. I was a kid. I was my dad owned a convenience a chain of convenience stores in Canada. They were kind of like gas station, um, like a shell station kind of here, yeah. uh, and so he had back then you know way back then uh in the 80s he actually had computers like this pcxt and um you know these things when they still had the turbo buttons to go from you know, like 60 megahertz to uh, uh yeah. 100 megahertz uh but he'd have these computers for his office and you know whatever they did with them bookkeeping i imagine but i'd get all the hand-me-downs so i learned to use them at a really early age and so I kind of self-taught on the computer side, um, which helped a lot. And then I was just, uh, I would just take things apart at home. Like I'd take apart the toaster and figure okay. out how it worked and right. put it back together and hope it worked. And most of the time it didn't, but, <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, which I think helped us really, um, especially at the beginning because we had access to a lot of really incredible talent really smart talent and engineers and sensor designers and they really we were doing things that they didn't even think of doing because we just didn't know so we were turning dials that they didn't realize would give the effects that it did um so yeah neither of us really had any experience we had access to people that obviously did but I, I really do think it helped us. Awesome. I, I sent Nick over there to make sure our computer that's recording the audio, it, it went to a screensaver. We're good. But I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> so, um, so the other Server question, crap. so you said, you know, like Peter Jackson, Fincher, all these people start kind of coming out of nowhere. How did they hear about y'all? Were y'all doing any sort of marketing or, or like no or was it all like word of mouth? It was all word of mouth. Uh, David yeah. Fincher and Soderbergh are, are close friends. So Fincher obviously saw what Soderbergh did. And he uh, he came along and he was doing, he's, he's kind of been with us. But the big movie for him was, so for us, was Social Network. Right. 
Um, and I think he was impressed. The thing that impressed Fincher was not just the pitcher quality, because that was, you know, obviously important. Um, but it's in situations where we would respond, you know, for social network, for example, there was this, this scene that he was shooting in those rowboats, um, those little rowboats that I knew they you were going to bring this story up. I love yeah, it. Well, I don't know. I, tell it, I, tell I, it. I love it. I probably told it a hundred times, but, um, but the cameras were too heavy. You know, the red one was a small camera and it was a light camera compared to everything out there. Right. But it was still too heavy for these little tiny boats that weighed nothing. Um, so he's like, I need it lighter. And, like, and I was like, well, we can't make it lighter. This is, you know, because kind of what it is. And he's like, no, I need to make it lighter. I'm like, okay, shit. Um, and I remember we were in Irvine. We didn't have any presence in, in Hollywood, but we were in Irvine and he drew drove down there. I remember sit in this parking lot in this industrial village. I remember sitting on the curb um, with him and he was like, you just got to figure this stuff out because I'm sick of, you know, talking to all these other companies and asking for stuff and they kind of smile and nod and it never gets done or gets done incorrectly. Um, and I was like, yeah, no, dude, you, you know, if we can do it, we'll do it. But, um, you know, this is to make it lighter. We really have to, to think of a way to solve this problem because we've kind of already went down that path. Uh, but this is where, you know, and this is the great, we had this machinist called David Valaquette who was, uh, working for us. And he was one of those six people. It was kind of like Matt and, and Veliquette. They were, and they were friends too, but he knew a carbon fiber guy, a guy that could lay up carbon fiber. And the top of the, the red one was this massive heat sink of, of aluminum that was pretty heavy. I mean, it was again, light compared to everything else, but that was an opportunity we thought, wow, if we just mold this out of carbon fiber, it's going to save a pound or two. The heat is kind of a problem, but it's, you know, they're in the, in the water in the morning and it's really cold. So maybe it's not a problem. So within 24 hours, we molded this because um, we had all the tools. We molded this carbon fiber kind of shell for the red one, replacing the aluminum and I called Fincher and I was like, okay, I think we've, we've saved two pounds or whatever the number was. And he's like, what, uh, you know, you got the idea. Like, no, we did it. We have the camera ready, nice. you know what? <laughs> and he was like, hey, shit, you know, he's like, oh, great. And that was just kind of the beginning of, you know, you, you obviously seen the Zeno before, but um, he's always that guy that has crazy ideas. And I build, you know, at, we're just always in the cycle of building him a custom camera to satisfy his needs. And we right. started obviously with that. That was kind of the first Fincher camera, this yeah. weird carbon fiber thing. Um, but it went on to uh, the where the DXL is, the, the camera we make for Panavision. That was actually one of the prototype Xeno cameras for Fincher. Uh. And Fincher was like, too many ports. We need to change it, blah, blah, blah. And um, I got one of those somewhere. But uh, so we kind of scrapped that idea, that camera, which was fully working camera and made this made this crazy Xeno thing and start working on that. And Panavision was going through an ownership change or a management change. Um, and I met the new manager um, and or the interim CEO, I think he was at that that time, got along with them. He's like, we we're making a camera, but it's not going well. You know, we should do something. And I was like, well, I have this camera. And he's like, that's exactly what we need. I'm like, hey, you know, let's make this into something. And that's kind of the, the birth of the DXL. So all of this, this work we've done with Fincher, it pays off. And it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't because we thought, Oh, we'll make this a uh, an actual monetize what we're doing with Fincher. It never was that intention. It was just right. like let's make what the filmmaker wants. Do the best um, you can do for like an individual. Client. Absolutely, yeah. 
It, absolutely. Because if you ask 10, even now, like if you go out and ask 10 people what their perfect camera is, you're going to get 10 different answers. Right. And of course, we can't do that with everybody, but we do it for ourselves and we do it with some of these people that are, and it's not, not because David Fincher is David Fincher. He's just been such a mentor, especially to me, um, that I learned so much from his dedication to technology in filmmaking. And there's a few filmmakers along the way that I can, and it doesn't matter how big or small they are. You know, Michael Bay was another, um, another guy like that where he had such a specific way of holding the camera. It really was about him holding the camera. You know, and this Bayham. Yeah, the Bayham. You know, the, I'm sure you've all seen this picture a million times, but that kind of, you know, how he holds that camera. Um, and that really was the start of the Ranger. Yep. And, you know, here's a white Bayham right here. But, um, <laughs> but that is, you know, that's this handle is Fincher. He, we met a couple times. He brought his favorite handles that he had a 235 Airy camera. And this is how he held them. And he's like, I just need a camera I can hold like this. Um, and that's kind of where we were like, okay, we can do that. No problem. And he right. was like, wow, this is cool. And we made that. And again, that evolved into the Ranger a few years later, but that wasn't the attention. It was just, wow, this guy's got such a unique requirement and we can do it so we want and it's nothing new panavision used to do that way back in the day i mean i remember when i first went to panavision you know 20 years ago you could walk in when you walked through the door there was the machine shop as you right beside the receptionist and a dp could go in there and say i need this bracket you know uh -huh. for this camera for this shot and this guy this old dude would whittle away on this old, you know, CNC machine. Yeah. <laughs> and I always thought that was the coolest thing because you're servicing that customer. Right. Um, that has such a filmmaking is such a interesting profession because it's so different. Every, as you guys know, yeah. every single job is just different. And you have these creative ideas that you need, you know, you need different accessories and you need to hold the camera or support the camera in different ways. And that's kind of that, that really, that Panavision experience when I was just starting out really, really made way to a lot of stuff that we do. Um, and, you know, it's why I created GDU in the same thing. Right. GDU was never about selling stuff. You know, that's, it's, it's not about that at all. It's about, making stuff for uh, these kind of brackets and stuff specifically for ourselves or filmmakers, big, or, big and small. And then it's just a lot cheaper for everybody if we make a bunch of them and then just sell, you know, sell a bunch of, sell the rest of them to everybody else and keep these, um, you know, for the filmmaker and for ourselves. And I just think that's a nice service to provide and there's no reason not to do it. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of financial sense. I mean, it's, it's, it turns into a good thing, but if you have to, if we had to convince a board of directors or the accountants, you know, we're spending this insane amount of money building a Zeno for David Fincher, they would tell us we're insane and cut us off from the bank account. <laughs> but, um, you know, so it doesn't make financial sense. It probably doesn't make business sense but it's what we love to do. So that's why we do it. Well, I think this is a good place to kind of transition into uh, like what y'all currently have, like specific, specifically talking about like Komodo and the V Raptor. Um, so George can testify to this, but I'm obsessed with the Komodo. <laughs> I talk mm -hmm. about it all the time. Um, He's been saving up for it. He saves all his checks that I yeah, get. Yeah, <laughs> I'm never going to be able to, I don't, I don't, not until I'm have, I'm an adult cause I can't afford it in college, but, um, poor college. Never kid. Ever. Well, yeah, that's true. But, um, I was thought it was so cool when it came out, especially because like I said before, you know, I was obsessed with red from like really young, um, kind of similar to what you were saying, except for 
I didn't know how to, I can't build a computer or anything. I'm not that smart. <laughs> but um, I guess the question I've been kind of wanting to ask is when you guys set out to t any camera that you're going to, you know, mass produce, like the Komodo, for example, um, do you set out and it's trying to take a specific place in the lineup? Like, for example, is the Komodo like meant to be a more entry level or is it meant to be, or you, you have an idea for a camera and the price is just what makes economic sense, you know, like, is there a lineup spot for it? I guess is what it I'm trying to get really, at. really, yeah, that's a great question because it kind of all depends on the camera. We, uh, we, I actually have one right here. One second. So the Komodo never was supposed to be an entry level camera. Right. We had this, we made this, this is the Scarlet 3K and you guys probably don't really remember this, but it was a, uh, you know, idea we had, even though the red one, which was $17,000, um, was cheap in the grand scheme of right. professional cameras. We had this idea of, you know, the $3,000 3k camera that, uh, was more accessible to everybody. So that, that really was one of the only, here's a entry kind of level camera. And we learned a lot from this, uh, camera because we built it and we've got thousands of these cameras, which are complete in boxes. I remember when it was finally done and I did it at this skateboard shoot. Um, we, we acquired the studio just at that time. So we had all these stages and I set up this big skateboard kind of rolling thing that, um, I learned from the barracks and the camera just wasn't good enough. Mm. Like it was just not, the lens was a little janky, but the three K just wasn't enough. Like we, this three K resolution just wasn't. So it was a very hard discussion that Jim and I both had. And, you know, it it was one of those, man, we spent a lot of money and a lot of work making this camera, but it's just not good enough. So we scrapped it. I mean, we killed it. And it, luckily we were able to go on to the Epic and then the Scar the, re the next, the Scarlet after that, um, that uh, was more accessible. But that's not the story for the, the Komodo. The Komodo was to specifically solve a problem of, you know, everybody was using our cameras for the big shots, the little shots and kind of everything in between. And we had this Ranger for the big studio setup, but everybody would always take GoPros and they'd have GoPros to go out and shoot the stuff, which was our cameras, even though this Epic is really small, um, they'd still need a GoPro for the right. really small stuff or something. They knew the camera was going to get hit hard and they didn't want to, to erase, you know, the $50,000 camera. Uh, so, and, and Phil Holland kind of termed it the utility camera, which I love, but it became, that's what the thing was. And Michael Bay was the guy that um, was the perfect, perfect person to, to kind of, test this thing beta test the camera out because he blows up more cameras than anybody i know like he literally just blows up cameras every single shoot um so we just went to the problem and gopro i love gopros i think gopros are great but when you mix them together with a proper camera you can only use half a second right. until you notice and it takes you out of the thing because it's like it's not a real camera um cinema camera right so we were like, let's make it small, um, as small as we possibly can and make it just enough resolution and make it so that it's affordable enough where when you break it, because it's made to be broken and it's not going to, you know, kill your insurance or, or, you know, really upset you if you're, you're the owner of it. And that's kind of, you know, the how we got to the size and the, the form factor is, I mean, my favorite still camera of all time is, 
and I still have it on my desk is the Mamaya RZ67, which is a medium format camera that I just love to this day. And it's obviously very similar to that. And I love the kind of waste finder, you know, this Mamaya you'd, you'd look down at um, and shoot it kind of that. And I'm so tall, I kind of had to do that anyways right. to shoot, you know, normal height people. <clears throat> I so I really you, love that. Yeah, I remember you posting a photo of that on your Instagram before Komodo was even talked about. And everyone, including myself, was like, something is going on. There's a reason he's <laughs> he's doing this. And then I don't know, several yeah. weeks later or whatever, we start hearing teasers of the of the Komodo. And so um that I, I I knew that that was there was some motivation for the the way that that was designed. Yeah, no, there it that definitely is, and I, you know I'm horrible at teasing people. I just do it too much, but there it. definitely was a a method to that madness and that form factor. And I've said it before many times, but just the size the size we got Komodo to, which was really difficult to do. I'm sure just felt in your hand so good. And you just wanted to shoot with the camera. Like you really just connected with that camera. Right. Um, and the target really was the Mamaya RZ67. And you can tell the engineers yeah. actually made it a lot smaller. Thank God. Um, and that kind of became our new form factor. And if you look at the Raptor, it's really just kind of a bigger Komodo because it's got a lot more horsepower in it. Um, but that form factor just kind of sticked. So, yeah, the form factor is how I became fascinated with it. And then when I saw the price, I was like, my dream could come true. Maybe like, <laughs> I was like, maybe it was the first time it felt reachable for somebody who doesn't a college, you know, kid. Yeah, college, a kid. college yeah, kid, a broke college kid. And that was the beautiful side effect. And, you know, we're not completely ignorant. We knew at that price point that it would be a lot of people would use it as an ACAM. I didn't let us, I didn't let that dictate the camera, though. Right. Um, the use case and the design. And once you go down that path, even if you have the intention of let's keep it a professional camera, once you even put in the mentality, this is a, a entry level camera or a baby camera to the monstro or whatever you start getting a lot of influence which is why i kind of lock myself up by myself um up in hollywood but everybody kind of says oh well we should take away this or take away that because it'll compete with monstro or oh. compete with you know, you that, that's every business goes through that. Every everybody that makes product is like we have an expensive product, we have a cheap product, we got to neuter the cheap product so it doesn't, yeah, you know, uh, affect sales of the big one. And that so I just completely obliterate every time anybody would anybody on my team would bring up, wow, this, you know, this is a indie camera or whatever, and I would just kill it dead because that's not why we made the camera. That's not what the the problem was um that we were solving and if we make this a professional top end camera that michael bay can go out and put shoot stuff next to his monstro and intercut them and not notice for however long he wanted to do it all the other stuff will come so so that was just kind of banned from our discussions and god forbid marketing and everything else because right we wanted to keep Komodo had to be true to its its nature and to what it was designed to do. And then everybody else, which happened was it was also a really great a camera for independent filmmakers or smaller productions. And that's you know, that was the surprise to us. Um, a lot of people ended up taking the Komodo and said, ah, I actually kind of like this more than the Monstro. And I'm going to use it as an A camera and B camera and C camera. And that was okay. You know, that was completely fine because it could do that. But the reality is if you take a Komodo and you want to make it a studio camera and put audio and wireless and all the other ports and build it up into something, you end up getting bigger than the monstro. Right anyways and and so it's kind of it's like you see with the mirrorless the dslrs 
love the a, the A9 or the A7s of the world um, and the Canon mirrorless and, and everybody that's doing that. But once you build them up to do, you know, all the outputs and all the inputs and everything else, it turns into this big kind of Frankenstein. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Um, and so many more so, things can go wrong too because so much absolutely. is not... It, it's not intended necessarily for pr like doing so much. And so I, yeah, I totally get that. So like with our camera and we'll talk about it a little bit, but we, you know, we knew we were going to need some of the inputs and outputs and stuff. And so we went for the production module, but yeah. it's all, it, it's very, it very much. we like essentially built our own Ranger, <laughs> like right before the Ranger <laughs> was actually like a thing. And so yep, I thought yep, it was yep. funny. We, and then we see Gemini Rangers coming out like several months after we got ours. And I'm like, dude, that's like, that's awesome. That's like exactly what we, we needed and wanted. And so, um, a couple more questions. Uh, we want to be respectful of your time. We appreciate you, you know, coming on and, and chatting with us. So, Y'all have released the DSMC three, um, DSMC three, uh, with the V Raptor, and it had super strong specs, like right out the gate. Uh, what can you tell us, if anything? Uh, because again, it's so strong. Like, how? What can we look forward to? Because when I look at this camera, I'm like, oh my god, it is the perfect camera. Yeah. You know what I mean? But of course, y'all y'all have bigger ideas and, and crazy, crazy. Yeah, things. it's. It's always, you know, and the Raptor was a, another great example. You know, Jim's been retired for many years now. Um, but when it was time to make, to start designing the Raptor, I asked him to come in and we kind of went to the sensor. It always starts with the sensor. Like the sensor is kind of the heart of the camera. Right. And so we went to the sensor, sensor team and kind of just laid out the specs of the sensor, what we think we want. And it really is um what we want you know the customers the input from the customers is so valuable and it's the one thing that jim obviously never forgot and that i never forgot is that we're customers before anything and that's kind of the it makes me a horrible boss like i am a really bad boss i'm not, and i'm not kidding <laughs> me too i i really am because i'll always choose the customer because i am a customer and that's not necessarily the best thing for business. And it's not what um, executives really have gone to school for so many years to learn what the most important thing is. And so that makes me, you know, I spend more time with my customers than I do with my employees because I'm a customer. I shoot Jim shoots. I mean, I'm, blessed if I get to shoot more and I'm slowly trying to make that transition to shooting more. Um, but I'm a customer first and a camera maker second. And that's really how I solve every decision that, that comes before. So the Raptor was as a customer, what I wanted, what Jim wanted, Jim was, you know, Jim was, um, definitely shooting love the the full frame stuff um but it was frame frame rates was kind of our next thing we hit that that point of dynamic range yep. where it's enough like this dynamic range is enough for almost everybody but you can always use more frame rates and frame rates were just kind of that pinnacle of what we needed to, for the Raptor was and DSMC three. I'm, I, I always include Komodo into DSMC three. Okay. We don't really advertise or market the Komodo as a DSMC three because there's some, um, really because of the accessories dictate what that is. Like uh, if you buy a DSMC three monitor, then it needs to fit on all right. cameras that are called DSMC three. So I get it. But Komodo really is at the heart of DSMC three because the the Komodo and the and the Raptor together they just look like the same family yeah. and they feel like the same family. Um, so I kind of bring that into it, even though we'll never really advertise that. <clears throat> but that that kind of gave birth to the the next camera the. 
Um, this guy, uh, the big raptor. I haven't. I haven't <laughs> seen that. I yeah, haven't seen that no, yet. Nobody has. Wow. Um, so, are you gonna be okay with us showing that a little bit? Yeah, of course. So the well, we've. I mean, we've talked about it, of course. Right. Uh, just nobody's actually seen it. So the XL is like the big, the Ranger version of, of the, the Raptor. Raptor. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I, so I saw the blueprints. Like we knew about. We know it, it existed. But we, but we, we knew had, it was a thing. But it's we been haven't, sitting there that whole time. We didn't, we didn't even know. know yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a V Raptor back yeah, there. Yeah, did too. Just a, uh, uh, the standard. Uh, I got. There's all sorts of stuff you probably shouldn't know about behind me, but. Um, <laughs> If you could see my desk in front of me right now, you guys would freak out. But uh, but no, it's it that and it and that wasn't like the Ranger was really um, just a bunch more ports for the Monstro. You know, people yep. needed more ports, and the XL is that. Plus, we're doing new things like we have the integrated, um, and I can show you kind of this. So. I won't show you that yet, but we have uh, NDs that NDs that teasing um, us, man. He loves and it. Electric NDs, and so well, I've 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 announced I've talked about it before, but uh, we have a, a RF to PL mount where it has electronic NDs, and you just right. You know, it's got little buttons, and you choose, and it goes into the side, much like the Canon RF adapter does. Yep, and that's cool, and you can use that on. Uh, Raptor and Komodo, and it just kind of works. Um, but for the XL, we have that built into the camera. Wow. And it was a kind of a new thing for us to have built in NDs, and the whole thing will slide away. So it's not just electronic <laughs> NDs. It's just so funny. Uh, well, I know, but it's so funny because, again, what you're talking about when we, when we did the Gemini thing – we got the motion mount because we wanted we that's why we wanted it for those nds because yeah. of the way that we shoot and so it's just it's funny for for me because it's almost like all of those things y'all already knew that people like us were wanting and so you were already probably thinking about this stuff before yeah. uh before any of this and so it's just it's fun and cool to see like you guys pay attention and you do listen because we're customers. Exactly. We're just like yeah. you. I'm just like you, man. Like You're like, I want internal NDs. Yeah. <laughs> seriously, it's really, it really is as simple as that. It's we need internal NDs. And then you sit there like, I wish this camera, I say that I wish this camera had internal NDs. And it's like, oh, wait, I can actually. That's what I do. <laughs> that happen. You know? It's that simple. It's just like you're sitting there like, ah, I wish this had internal NDs. And the motion mount was awesome. The problem with the motion mount is when it's off, you still lose a little bit of light right, when it's right. completely yeah. off. Um, whereas this with the XL, we made it so that it actually oh, cool. goes completely away, uh, which is great. Um, and, you know, that's that's kind of a – so that's an elevation of the Ranger – when it comes to the XL, it's not just ports. Now we're adding a little bit more yeah, to dude. and Sick. and so that's an exciting um that's kind of an exciting future for that for the for the DSM C three. And then of course, you know, we're always making something new. Yeah. There's more stuff that kind of comes after that. Um just right, like the supply chain stuff is brutal. Oh yeah, I bet. Like, I'm sure, even as a customer, I mean, I've, I've, you try to order a stove and it takes, you know, eight months to get the stove. You try to buy a PlayStation and I mean, Not forget happen. About it. Yeah, yeah. Nothing yeah. Happen. Video card, you know, every yeah. every industry that makes anything, even not an electronic, like even aluminum, is at a shortage. Um, it's just really hard to make anything right now. Uh, but hopefully that will change. I was really excited about it kind of in December when things started to calm down, COVID seemed to be kind of under control. And then of course the Omicron came out and now we're having record outbreak yeah. of COVID yeah. again. So it's yeah. like, ah, oh, Jesus, what a crappy way to start the, the year. But 
So in terms of new stuff, like how long in advance do you know, like almost the full picture of what something's going to be before it comes out? Like, you know, the Komodo came out on this date, but you knew a year, two years before that, like, you, I guess how or, long yeah. for our research and development, how long for yeah, that I mean. side of things for y'all before you actually have a, a product? That changes with every camera because it really is what goes wrong. I mean, it's right. really, you can make something, you can have, we can have an idea for a camera or a sensor. And it's really the sensor is the, probably the most difficult part of it. Um, but with Komodo, it took way too long because there's, you know, we were doing the global shutter for the first time. Yep. Right. And, it's kind of like you get to a point where like, oh, we're almost there. And then you realize, oh, crap, there's a problem with the sensor. Or there's a problem with one of the processors in the camera. And that kind of resets the clock. So there's not really um, there's not really a, not like a 18 months. You know, there's a right, lot of right. companies that that just like I'm sure Apple down to like they say, you know, there is 271 days it takes us to build something new and they have 500,000 people doing it. So right. they can do that for us, it's kind of have the idea um, and let's make it or try to make it. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that gets abandoned along the way, uh, but it really depends on how many board spins we have to do, how many sensor spins we have to do. And then when we get close enough um, and we have prototypes and we're shooting it and uh, then we start to talk about it. And, you know, Raptor, Raptor was a great one because I didn't even really tease that camera until the day it was launched. Yeah. There was, that was kind of a surprise for a lot of people. But I was shooting Raptor. I have a place in Big Sur in, in California, which is this in, incredible um, nature on the coast. Uh, but I was shooting that it for six months up there during wow. COVID. Yeah. During COVID. So it was awesome because I was trying to kind of keep away from people. So I was, it was just, we just purchased this, this house up there uh, during COVID and it was just myself, um, my wife and the foxes. Like we had these foxes on our property and they would always come up onto this little log and I've, I'm, I posted the footage, but yeah. it was such an awesome way to test a camera Uh because I got it, there's rain and there's cold and right. there's hot and there's fog and there's all this this time lapse stuff and this wireless video. This wireless stuff was really because this log is way the hell out there, and I want to make sure I can see what's going on. All that that uh, network connectivity of, especially on Raptor, but it's it's in Komodo as well you can remote control these cameras right. um and the the pre-record time like the pre-record on raptor kept the, we kept making it longer and longer because i kept missing the shot of these foxes because nature is the best thing for pre-record because when the whale jumps out of the water and you're pre-recording you can't you have to pre-record because you never know when it's going to happen right right so, but it was a great, that was a great situation of testing the camera, testing the media, because it was a new media as well. So a new type of media. And I got really, really good at breaking media. And, um, you know, all these companies that advertise super high sustained rates, they just all kept failing. And then Angelbird and Angelbird was really great because like, oh, we can modify the firmware a little bit and we've got new stuff coming. Um, but that was kind of a lot of time spent on just making sure that the the cards were good. So there's so that I that was a long-winded answer to your question, but it really um it really isn't how long it takes. It's the real question is how long we until we start talking about it. Right. And that's different all the time. Sometimes it's just a surprise, like Raptor was. 
Sometimes it's kind of a lead up like Komodo was and Komodo that lead up was because we needed the, it was, since it was a crash cam, that was its sole purpose was to take the hits and keep going. It took a long time for us to actually test it and test it yeah. and test it again. And so we could talk about it while we were testing because we knew it would take an extra six months of testing because it had to be such an indestructible little camera that we could talk about it because somebody was going to see it as, you know, where the Matrix was blowing it up when yep. they started um, shooting or Michael Bay was blowing it up. Somebody's going to see the damn camera. So we might as well start talking about it. But it just takes a while right. to come. And some of it's testing, some of it's engineering. Well, let me just say this. There's, uh, you know, one or two more things where I know we're almost out of time, but um, the durability of all of the cameras that come from RED is blows my mind. And I'm I'm a real a living example of that because this, this camera here, um, the Gemini, we were out filming uh, for a documentary um, that we shot almost entirely on that Gemini that we actually ended up winning an Emmy for. Um, and when we, by the way. thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, we were blown away that that happened. But um, when we were out filming, we were uh, we were out on location, and it's pouring down rain on this awning, and we're like, figure, like, how are we gonna shoot this interview with all this rain on this metal awning and everything, and. Uh, Adam, uh, one of the guys that, that works with us, uh, Adam and I are standing there kind of trying to figure this out. And I look over and I realize that part of the awning had actually busted behind us and water is pouring into <laughs> this Gemini. And mm -hmm. my heart just dropped. I was like, you've, yeah, I had it for like a month or two. I was like, you've got to be freaking <laughs> kidding me. And we run over there and we get it. It was like a pitcher of water being poured onto this camera. And I like get it and we kind of like shake it off and dry it out the best we can. And we're like, dude, we have an interview. Like we're about to shoot. And so oh. we just, we leave it alone. We dry it off the best we can. We shake it out. We move locations to somewhere indoors. And I'm like, here we go. And I turn it on and it boots up perfectly Ooh, no beautiful. no issues the one of the audio ports on the production module was being a little weird so we used the other one because you know it has two and i'm like you know what it's gonna be okay and then the next day it had dried for 24 hours i check it both audio ports are fine so like everything is completely fine and working we have had zero issues with this camera so um, the durability of all of them, not just the Komodo, even though Komodo is built to take a beating, I, I, everyone is always like, wow, this camera is so like beefy and heavy and strong and sturdy. I feel like any of these cameras could, could honestly take a beating. Um, so with all that said, I'm talking about this camera. My final question, and uh, Nick Golden thought it was funny the way, the way that I said it. Um, but your you've been known from time to time to see someone and just I don't know be generous, be be the guy that's like you know what we're gonna we're gonna help these people out for whatever reason and and give them a camera or give them you know a discount or whatever. You gave us a camera. Why? <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> what in the world? We so we had we had zero <laughs> zero expectations of anything and then we we got this incredible piece of equipment that has helped literally push our company so far and then even more importantly to me and I've told you this before is the relationship that we now have with you and with Red and we feel like we're automatically part of this big family but yep. again why in the what what in the world did we do <laughs> So this, it's awesome. It's an awesome question. And people, I do, I don't do it often, but I like, I love doing it. And that, you know, and I get asked, I don't want to tell you how many times a day, but somebody will write and like, give me a free give camera. Me a camera. Yeah. Free, I, and free I figured camera. that would happen. And I've never, ever, never, ever responded to that. That's just not right. Um, right. something I do. But I remember your little video that you 
you, and I think it was on Facebook that I saw it. Um, I remember distinctly it was during NAB and I was in my hotel room and it was just, it was a shitty day. It was a really shitty day. And I can't even remember why it was such a shitty day, but it was just a really shitty day. Something probably was wrong with NAB. I hate NAB. Um, (laughs) uh, NAB is just a bad, if you're a manufacturer and you make stuff, it just screws up the whole program because you have to make this flashy thing. It takes the whole team out of everything for at least a month. And it just, it's beautiful meeting people and meeting your friends. And that's what NAB is really good for. Um, But anyways, it was a really kind of shitty day. And I remember coming across your video and I was like, wow, this fucking guy is, I mean, it was funny, but it was, is this, and I told you this before, there's that talent that is so rare. And I went to, and you've probably seen it a bunch of times now, but once you see all the people out there doing things, and there's a whole bunch of people that do cool stuff, big and small, you kind of know that this, there's something special here. There's something really special that this guy has that needs to be nourished Mm -hmm. and i'm in a position where i can say let's give him some water and Mm -hmm. and see how he grows because i've dude i've been in that i lived out of my truck you know when i moved to vancouver i was living out of a van um i've been in that position where you don't where buying a camera is a really big decision and you probably can't afford it um the one you actually want uh but there's certain times where you know if that person just has a better camera and camera and scott did this beautiful video today i think where he was kind of listing all the things you need um and camera is kind of the least important thing in making a good film and it's right. it's great as a camera maker i'll admit that the camera is the last fucking thing you don't need a raptor to make it great i'll tell everybody social network you watched that film and it was a beautiful film and that shot in the red one right every filmmaker i know every really talented person i could give them a red one which is 15 years old and they could make a beautiful film you and that's a red one you can take that with any mirrorless camera or and there's exceptions, of course, but um, the camera is the not the thing you need for greatness. But it sure takes away some of the some of the restrictions, right. and it builds the confidence. Yep. And that's a big thing when you don't have to compromise or think about ah, this is going to kind of be a shitty because the quality is shitty. If you're super talented and you no longer have to worry about that, it lets you kind of grow and put the the focus on, wow, now I can, instead of buying this camera um, or worrying about the camera, I can put this into any, think about how much you've grown and it's got nothing to do with us, but think about how much you've grown over the last couple. It's insane. I mean, it really is insane. It's insane how much you've, you've blown up. And that, and I knew that I, you know, I want, I want to take credit for seeing it, but it's you, it's all you, man. Like I just saw, and I was like, holy shit, let's help this guy because he's going to go places. And when he's a fucking superstar, maybe he'll remember us. (laughs) And, And I'm serious. Like you're, you had that little spark and I was like, holy shit. Like, this is the person that probably could appreciate this oh yeah and do something with it because we we have a lot of customers that shoot incredible things we have also have a lot of customers that might have they buy a camera because for whatever reason and maybe use it for an hour and you know, i mean we get cameras back that have an hour runtime wow. on them, you yeah. know um so we i knew you would put it to use because you had that talent and even if you didn't it just made me feel good that it was one less thing for you to worry about. And that, and I love where you've kind of built and what, and, and all of your troops around you have developed into this great, 
beautiful thing. And I can't even remember when you came here. When was that? It was literally like two weeks before COVID went crazy. (laughs) So it was right at the very, it was February of 2020. Wow, yep. that was insane. You're right. It was right before. But that's the kind of stuff. It's like, you're right. It's a family. Like, it is a family. Yep. And you help each other out. And um, so why we gave you a camera. And it's just that it's the spark, man. It's the spark that you have inside you. You have that talent. And, you know, don't let your head get too big. But it's a very, very rare thing. <laughs> it really is. Well, and you can take that as far as you want to take. I mean, you can take over the world because you've been gifted with, and it is a gift. You don't learn that shit. You've been gifted with something that, um, that is special. I want to attest to the spark being somebody that was hired after all of this. I will never forget as long as I live. The first time I saw a red camera in person, remember obsessed with it my whole life was at my interview with him. And he comes in. I was like, yeah, I've never even seen one. He's like, come on in. And he like brings me in and puts it in my hand. And I'm like, what is going on right now? And it's just like that, like that little moment of him, like, like try to teach and like just you it sounds dumb but like giving me this moment of seeing one for the first time like it's like very similar vibe for me yeah. and i i feel it every day so well i remember too our we've we're almost at 480 gigs of uh of runtime by the way <laughs> we're about to lose our rant over here but um i remember too you said when when i hired you I could tell you were nervous to ask, but he says, Hey, I'm like shooting this thing. Is there any way I could maybe shoot it on the red? I was like, yeah, take it. Like, dude, absolutely. Like, and, and he, I remember you were like, I can't believe you trusted me with this. I was like, dude, like I was given this gift. Like I'm going to do this. And then, I mean, it was a, it's a small gesture, but the guy, um, that still works here today. His name is Gavin young dude. Uh, we gave him his first camera. And so obviously it was a much smaller piece of equipment, but I was like, dude, we're gonna, we're gonna let it trickle down however we can. And so I gave him one, one of my like starter DSLRs. And now, you know, he's, he's buying himself cameras and lenses and he's working here full time and everything. So, um, but dude, as you, as you know, um, uh, from the bottom of my heart, always going to be so appreciative. And again, it was it was that confidence boost. I had just started like building a team and bringing people on, and that's how I was even able to make that stupid video. Is because I actually have people around that can film me, and I can film them. And so we had we had just gotten going. I had been freelancing, you know, with a with a DSLR and and some smaller like lower level cinema cameras. Um, you know, for four or five years at that point. But then I start bringing people on, we make this silly video and then this happens and I'm like, okay, like we're a real company now. Like we're a real, (laughs) we're a real production company now. And we have been hired many times because we have this piece of equipment. And again, like, so it does, you know, in certain situations and especially we do so much corporate and documentary in those worlds, there is a level of expectation that we could not meet until now. And yeah, we absolutely couldn't have afforded. I mean, we couldn't afford anything at that, you know, when I, cause I was just bringing people on. So I have overhead now and all this. And so it was incredible. We get this camera and literally like two weeks later, we get hired for this documentary. And then we're like, dude, we have a real camera. We can shoot this thing on. So it made all the difference. So awesome. man, we appreciate all the time that you've given us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, again, I'll always be super grateful for for our friendship that we have, um, and uh, I know that camera is about to die, so we're about to head out. Nick, was there anything else you wanted to say before we? I head just out? wanted to say thanks, and also you're a really good salesman because now you made me want the Komodo even more. So <laughs> <laughs> one day I promise uh, I'll be awesome. I'll be a customer one day. I love I you guys. <laughs> awesome, dude. Thank you so In much. Fact, we're gonna let you get back it. to work. Take it easy, bro. All right. Thanks, guys. Peace. Night.
This podcast was produced by Nick Golden with executive producer George Edmondson, edited by Nick Golden and Gavin Manning. Be sure to subscribe, drop a like and a comment. Tune in every Monday for brand new podcast content, and we'll see you on the next one.